Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of the still untitled cybersecurity news segment, though they're not necessarily untitled for too much longer. You see, last week I asked you guys for ideas, for name suggestions on what we should call this call this thing, and I had some interesting suggestions. There's satanic cyber security news, um, worm food, satanic ritual, and here's another one. Uh, the idea. Okay, so thank you everyone for your suggestions. Though the one that caught my eye, and that I think I'm gonna go with on an interim basis, at least, is the week web. Now, now think about it. I'd be discussing what went on every week on the web of that was weak from a, from a security standpoint. So the weak web, it's, it's a play on words. It's a pun. I think it's, I think it's pretty good. It's pretty clever. Um, so thank you, George. Apparently that's pronounced Jorge. Well, thank you, Jorge. Um, for that suggestion. If I go with it on a, on a permanent basis, I know maybe I'll give you a prize or something, but that, that's the running title. Let me know what you think of that in the comments because I would be really interested to know. But anyhow, this week on the week web. Apple says sorry for Siri, Twitter's CEO got hacked, and more bug bounty drama. But first, we're gonna start with this week in stupid. This week we've got a pretty good one, a pretty good one. If you know anything about Bitcoin, Bitcoin mining in particular, you'll know that mining requires a lot of affordable energy because energy cost is one of the main running costs for miners, apart from I don't know, rent or, or whatever. But anyway, it's a good idea to mine in countries where energy is cheap and plentiful. For example, China. And if you're in China, it's a good idea to set up near a hydroelectric dam, for example, because energy is just so goddamn cheap. There's, they've got tons of it. But how about inside a nuclear power station? Well, it turns out Ukrainian authorities are investigating the employees of a nuclear power station after, get this, they connected the nuclear power facility to the internet to mine crypto. Now, it should be fairly obvious why connecting a nuclear power facility to the internet is a, a god-awful idea. Don't, don't do it. Whilst free energy, yes, I, I, I rate the hustle, it leaves open a major attack vector for infiltration. Remember Stuxnet? the Israeli US, or rather alleged Israeli US cyber weapon that broke into Iran's nuclear power stations. They got in using infected USB drives and they planted the Stuxnet worm, which caused the centrifuges in these power stations to essentially spin out and just destroy themselves, thus setting back Iran's nuclear program. And I guess it succeeded. However, I imagine it may have been somewhat easier to get in in the first place if the power station was connected to the internet. Of course, if, if they got in that way, they wouldn't have had to pay a guy to litter these USB sticks outside the power station, or however they did it, I'm not sure. I'm not sure people know. Now, Ukraine only has four nuclear power stations, so by taking out one of them, you're effectively taking out a quarter of Ukraine's nuclear energy supply, which I imagine represents um, quite a lot of their energy. So it shouldn't be too surprising that the Ukraine Secret Service is investigating this as a potential breach of state secrets, because nuclear power stations are critical infrastructure, and I imagine there's certain other countries that would love a backdoor into, into one of these stations. Secret Service raided the facility, and they found a bunch of RX-470s doing their thing. Now, because of that, I doubt they were mining Bitcoin. Maybe Ethereum, at a guess? If you have any better ideas, let me know in those comments. Several employees have been charged, though there's no word on anything else. I suppose it's just making its way through the, through the legal system at this point. However, it should be noted, it's not the first time this has happened. In 2018, engineers from the Russian Nuclear Center were arrested for using the agency's supercomputer to mine crypto. And similar cases have happened in Australia and Romania. Though hopefully, by the time this Cavalier crypto crew is released, their crypto will have gone to the moon and they'll be rich, though somehow, somehow I, I doubt it. So before we move on to our next story, I should quickly mention today's sponsor, me. My website, maltronics.com, is offering USB protectors. Now, if you don't know what a USB protector is, just think about all the times you charge your mobile phone, you charge your devices from public charging points. Say, for example, on a plane, on a bus, some parks have them. These USB charging points that are becoming way more common well, you don't know what's on the other side of that charging point. You don't know whether there's anything malicious that could be screwing with your device, sealing your data. So a USB protector simply strips the data lines from that USB connection, meaning you just get the power and nothing else, no data transfer 
whatsoever. Check them out. I'll link them in the description, maltronics.com. There's a bunch of other stuff on there. I'm sure you'll find something you like. Next up, Apple say sorry for Siri. But what could Siri have possibly done to warrant an apology? Well, well, it may surprise you, or, or not, to find out that Apple has been recording your conversations and getting real, real humans to listen back to them. So Apple calls this process grading. The idea is, is that they pay third-party contractors, so these people don't even work for Apple. They pay third-party contractors to listen in to Siri recorded conversations and then grade them on their audio quality in a bid to increase audio accuracy. Though many of these recordings take place when Siri is activated unintentionally, which happens a lot going f coming from someone who, you know, uses an Apple Watch and an iPhone. Please don't, don't judge. Please be nice in the comments. So this story was originally broken by The Guardian and a former contractor leaked. There have been countless instances of recordings featuring private discussions between doctors and patients, business deals, seemingly criminal dealings, sexual encounters, and so on. These recordings are accompanied by user data showing location, contact details, and app data. So if that doesn't sound slightly chilling, I don't know what does. Though despite this, Apple say they don't associate your Apple ID with any of these recordings. They say they can't be tied back to you as an individual. But I mean, if if, if, an, if a recording contains me talking about uh, addresses, someone's name, someone's telephone number, then sure it, it leads back to me. How could you How could you suggest it doesn't? Though according to the register, Siri uses a random identifier, a string of letters and numbers associated with a single device to keep dabs on data as it's being handled instead of connecting it to a user's Apple ID or phone number. They go on to say, after six months of being on the server, the device's data is disassociated from this random identifier. Though surely this means that for six months, a recording can be tied to other recordings from the same person if they have the same identifier. Though The Guardian does say that no individual recording can be easily linked to other recordings, so, so it's not clear to me how this data is identified and if recordings can be linked. There's conflicting information there. Though personally, if it was true, then that would be pretty worrisome that Apple would have the ability, or third-party contractors would have the ability, probably, probably worse, that they have the ability to manually hop from conversation to conversation, building context around an individual. Though every cloud does have its silver lining, and given the backlash, Apple is apparently changing their practices. Once this all came out, Apple released a statement. We know that customers have been concerned by recent reports. We heard their concerns, immediately suspended human grading of serial requests, and began a thorough review of our practices and policies. So that's, that's good to hear. And not really surprising, given recently Apple has really been trying to bolster their image when it comes to privacy and security concerns. If you watch their last keynote, a lot of the features they were implementing were very security and privacy oriented. So that's something they're trying to go really hard on. However, they will be resuming this practice of recording people's conversations uh, later this fall, or by fall, I think they mean autumn. So now you'll have to opt in to having your conversations recorded instead of it being assumed that you're okay with this. So the default will be that you've opted out. So to have these conversations recorded, you will explicitly have to opt in. Though I should note for fairness that it's not just Apple and hot water here. Amazon's Alexa and Google's Google Home have all had their bouts with privacy. This isn't anything exclusive to Apple themselves. Next up, it seems every week the topic of bug bounties just somehow manages to finagle its way into the news. Google has just announced a new bug bounty program, though they're not after bugs per se. They're in the search of Android apps or Chrome extensions that misuse data. In particular, the program aims to identify situations where user data is being used or sold unexpectedly or repurposed in an illegitimate way without user consent. So the way this works, and by the way, these rewards that they're offering are up to $50,000, so they're being very serious about this. The program aims to reward anyone who can provide verifiably and unambiguous evidence of data abuse, Google said. So it's live on HackerOne, and they've given it this really catchy moniker, the DDPRP, the Developer Data Protection Reward Program. Slick. So what, why is Google going to the trouble of creating this new program? Well, Google doesn't want to go through what Facebook did with Cambridge Analytica. Facebook took flack not just because the Cambridge Analytica thing happened on their platform, but because they didn't do much to prevent it happening in the first place. And I'm sure you'll remember in the wake of the Cambridge Analytica scandal, all those hearings in DC with Zuckerberg 
acting weird and we, we got those memes and well, I, I suppose it was worth it if we got memes, you know, can't complain. But anyway, given the sheer amount of data Google is sitting on, it's only a matter of time until an unscrupulous developer comes along and decides to funnel off some of Google's user data to themselves. So by launching this program, they have an easy out, an easy defense if there were to be some kind of data misuse scandal involving Google. They could say, oh, well, we did what we, we could. We put resources into this. We put time and energy, but you know, these things happen. And to be fair to them, this program is probably a very good idea to, to tackle this. It's very hands-off for Google. They can just let others do the work. And when someone comes around with an example of data misuse, well, they have enough money to just pay them off and you know fix that up. So this is a good thing. This is a good thing. Also in Google bug bounty news, Google is expanding their Google Play Store bug bounty program to include any Android app over 100 million installs. So even if an app doesn't have its own bug bounty program, and even if it's not made by Google, it's just some random developer, if it has over 100 million installs, then it's included in the bug bounty program, which means Google will pay out on the developer's behalf, even if they don't have their own bug bounty program. And if they do have their own bug bounty program, then they pay on top of whatever that program pays. So it's great for bug hunters. Now, if only Apple did something similar, then the heckler in this clip would have something to smile about. Objects you need to launch. And so it takes linking completely out of the equation. Boom, gone. Link time, over. Zero. Zero link. So the last bit of news I have for you today is that last week saw the hack of Twitter's Jack. Now, if you don't know who Jack is, at Jack is the CEO of Twitter. His account, his Twitter account was hacked and it started spewing out a cabal of very, very intriguing tweets. So this hack wasn't a political statement. It wasn't seemingly for anything useful or arguably useful. It was just a joyride, essentially. So if you were on Twitter at the time, then you will have been treated to some very, very interesting and intelligent tweets. Uh, I, I won't say them. Someone will clip me and use them against me, no doubt. Though I'll, I'll, I'll put a few up. I'll put a few up. So yeah, this went on for 30 minutes and a group calling themselves the Chuckle Gang took, took responsibility. But how did this hack happen? Well, it turns out it wasn't a very sophisticated hack after all. Someone noticed these tweets were being sent via the Cloudhopper client. Now, Cloudhopper was a messaging company Google acquired in 2010. Though it turns out that all tweets being sent via SMS are automatically marked as being from the Cloudhopper client. So one thing led to another, and eventually the conclusion was reached that this was a SIM swap hack. Now, a SIM swap hack, if you're not familiar, is essentially a social engineering hack. It's where you'd call someone's mobile phone carrier. Say, for example, the victim was on AT&T. So you'd call AT&T and somehow convince them to swap the SIM card associated with that certain phone number with a different SIM card that you own. So, for example, you might convince them that you are the victim and that you've lost your mobile phone and thus need to swap the phone number to another SIM card. And once they've done that, well, it allows you to send text messages from that certain phone number. And it just so happens that Twitter allows you to send tweets via text. Now, this type of hack is really frustrating because there's not much you can do to prevent it, to stop it. The goons at AT&T customer service, or whatever your carrier is, are always going to be gullible enough to give some idiot your, your SIM card, your phone number. It's just not much you can do. The moral of the story is just don't use SMS for anything important. Use a device-based authenticator, not a SIM-based one. This video was made possible by PCBWay. Whenever I need PCB fabrication, I go to them for their competitive and reliable service. They've just launched their advanced PCBs, perfect for professional applications, including industrial equipment, instrumentation, automotive, and communication equipment due to the high reliability and stable quality. Check the link in the description, pcbway.com. So that's all we've got for this week's edition of the Week Web. What do you think of that name, Week Web? I'm genuinely interested to hear your thoughts. So let me know down in the comments. I don't think there's anything else. So uh, stay tuned for more hacking videos. Have a good one.